And uh, so I'm going to ask that you would open your Bibles. This is a good Friday. And I want to ask that you'd open your Bibles to John chapter 19. We're going to begin in verse 16. The title of our message is Famous Last Words. Father, thank you for just your heart that we have seen so abundantly in the word that you show us what Christ did in our behalf. So we open our heart now and say, God, move through your word. As we come to this day, we recognize the great price that was paid for our salvation, our redemption. In Jesus' name, amen. I tell you, this is the most unusual uh, set of circumstances. We, in 30 years, have never had uh, services miss out on the resurrection and Good Friday services that we would normally have with great crowds here. But we are going to celebrate, right? I'm so thankful that we have this technology to be able to connect because we are living in such unprecedented times and there's a lot of uncertainty. And we need to be able to understand what is happening and there's so, there's so much uncertainty right now. When will things get back to normal? Will this crisis have a long-term impact on our nation? Fear and anxiety and uncertainty can take hold when the very fabric of the world seems to be torn apart. See, this is important to recognize. We live in a broken world and the world needs hope. It's times like these that makes you really stop and think about what matters in life. Makes you really step back begin to look at your priorities, it makes you consider eternity, it makes you think about your soul. You know, there's an aspect of the, of the human uh, nature, the human soul, that's searching, always searching, always looking, always longing. There must be more. The human soul searches, there must be more. And there is. See, we're not just flesh and blood. Yeah, we're made of flesh and blood, but so much more. See, we have a soul, and that soul within us longs, searches for answers. Well, God sent his son. He is God's answer to the soul's emptiness, to the soul's desire, to the soul's thirsting for meaning and purpose and hope. God gives an answer. His answer is Jesus Christ. And Jesus said that God sent him to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save. In another place, a place, Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, which is to suggest that he's calling out your name, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He's pursuing. He's seeking. See, he stands at the door and knocks. So we know he seeks, but how does he save? I'm glad you asked. It has everything to do with Good Friday. See, this is the day that we recognize what Jesus has done for us on the cross. He paid the penalty for our sins. He took on himself the wages of the sin that we deserve to pay ourselves. That's how he saves. Pontius Pilate, looking at the context of the story in John 19, Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman governor over Israel at the time, he actually wanted to free Jesus, but he had little choice under pressure from the Jewish leaders uh, who wanted him to be crucified, so he relented. And then it says that he took a basin and some water. He washed his hands in front of all of them, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. And then he had Jesus scourged, delivered him to be crucified. Now, the cruelty of crucifixion, of course, is infamous. But mockery was added. He suffered so much. The crowns of thorn that was pressed into his head and the, the spitting and the mockery and added to the cruelty which Jesus suffered. This was the wrath of God that Jesus spoke of. This was the wrath. This was the cup of the wrath of God that each of us deserved to drink because of our sins. Jesus took it in our place. That, See, that's the very heart of the gospel. The good news is that he took it in our place. He died and suffered that which we deserved. See, when Jesus was crucified and hanging on the cross, I want us to look at this because there were seven sayings 
of Christ on the cross. And each of these revealed God's heart. They show God's heart because it's very personal. I want you to see that it's very personal. These words show God's heart and they must be personally received and personally applied. In fact, I suggest that because of the suffering of Jesus Christ on the cross and the, the words that he declared while he was being crucified, I suggest that it will change your final words as well. You know, there's some famous last words in history. What are the last words that people speak? Um, here's some famous ones. I did some research for you. Uh, Elizabeth I, Queen of England, her last words, she said, all my possessions for a moment of time. How interesting. Um, Thomas Hobbes, famous writer, his last words, I'm about to take my last voyage, he said, a great leap in the dark. Which is sad. Um, Edgar Allan Poe, very famous writer and poet. His last words, Lord, help my poor soul. That's revealing. That's revealing. Other last words are interesting. You know, Thomas Jefferson, famous architect of the, uh, of the Constitution and Declaration of Independence. His last words, he said, is this the fourth? Those were his last words. He died on, on July 4th. They're interesting. Um, another interesting set of last words, General John Sedgwick, who was killed during the uh, Civil War in a battle of the Civil War, his last words were, they couldn't kill an elephant from this distance. Okay, that was his last words. See, okay. Let's move on from that. But then there are last words that help us understand that in Jesus, we have the glory of dying well. It will change your last words. Here's some famous examples. Martin Lloyd-Jones. I, I, I love some of his writing. Tremendous pastor and commentator. He wrote, he said this, last words of Martin Lloyd-Jones. Don't pray for my healing, he said. Don't hold me back from the glory. And then he passed. D.L. Moody, very, one of the most famous uh, uh, preachers in church history. D.L. Moody, last words. Earth recedes. Heaven opens before me. If this is death, it is sweet. God is calling me. I must go. And he breathed his last. I'm telling you, that is glorious. That is glorious. You know, when my own father died, I tell you what a difference faith made in the way that he died. So he had, many of you know this story, he had wasted most of his life. He had separated himself. He was alone and lonely. But then, many of you know this story. At 75, he finally opened his eyes. He came to faith. We invited him to church. He came to faith in Jesus Christ at 75. We had four years with him. And then when he was 79... I tell you what a difference faith made in the way that he died. Because now, his family is surrounding him, holding his hands. I remember praying when he took his last breath. Father, into your hands, I commend his spirit. It changes. See, in other words, the death of Christ on the cross will change your death as well. He defeated death that you might have eternal life. That when you breathe your last, it's a glorious graduation. It's your coronation day. It's the day you step into eternity into the presence of the living God. He won that for you. He won that for you on the cross. And that's why I want to look at the last words of Jesus on the cross. Now, there are several of the Gospels that speak of some of the words and phrases that Jesus used on the cross. I want to look at John chapter 19, beginning in verse 16, and, and grasp part of the story from this Gospel. So we start at verse 16. So he then delivered him to them to be crucified. This is Pontius Pilate, delivered Jesus to be crucified. Then they took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is Golgotha. Now, when we go to Israel, we go to this place where there is a, 
uh, it's interesting how the like the 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 way the cliff face is, the sun shines on it in such a way like there is a, a skull right on the cliff. It's very fascinating. There it was that they crucified him with and with him two other men, one on either side, Jesus in between. Pilate wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. And it was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. Therefore this inscription, many of the Jews read, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near to the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. The soldiers, therefore, verse 23, when they had crucified Jesus, they took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. They said, therefore, to one another, let us not tear that, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled saying, they divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots, Psalm 22. Therefore the soldiers did these things, but there were standing by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, that would be John, that they were standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to John, the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. After this, verse 28, Jesus, knowing that all things had been accomplished in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop. That's fascinating. You could do a, a study of that hyssop and you would be amazed. And then they brought up the sour wine to his mouth. Then when Jesus therefore had received the sour wine, he said, to tell us thy, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. We know in another place, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I want us to look at these last words of Jesus on the cross and understand how they apply. Because this is so important. It's, it's what, he, what he did for us that we have to recognize. Starting with this, by his death, he gives life. This is one of the glorious parts of the gospel. By his death, he gives life. Tells us, when you look at the gospels, that after they had Jesus scourged, they led him down the Via Dolorosa, the way of suffering. When you go to Israel, we always walk the Via Dolorosa. Along the way, it says that they found a man of Cyrene from North Africa, a man named Simon, whom they pressed into service to carry the cross for Jesus. This man had found himself in a divine appointment. No doubt he had come to Jerusalem for the Passover. But now he finds himself involved in something that he had no idea. But he stayed there to find out more about this man. And he watched him on the cross and he heard those words. The last words that Jesus spoke on the cross. And the eyes of his heart were opened. And in fact, we know from history that this man's sons, Alexander and Rufus, they became leaders in the church that was started then in North Africa because of this man. Oh, I, I just imagine. I imagine this Simon of Cyrene when he came home to his wife. What he must have said to his wife and to his sons when he came home. I saw him. Can you just imagine the story? I saw him. I saw the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I carried his cross. You should have seen his eyes. I just imagine what he said. 
But then we look at the Gospels and we understand that the very first words that Jesus spoke on the cross were these. Father, he said, forgive them. They know not what they do. These were the first words Jesus spoke. And from these words, you immediately see God's heart, God's nature, his character, forgiveness. It's hard to imagine Jesus speaking such words. But these are the words that show us the way of God, the character of God, God's heart toward us and the heart that God wants us to have toward others. The same heart that he has, he wants us to also have. Notice Matthew 5, verse 44. I say to you, Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. In other words, you will be like your father. You will be like God. In this, have this nature, have the same character. It's interesting that Jesus said, they know not what they do. Very interesting. When Jesus returns at the end of the age, and I want to soon look at that, but when Jesus returns at the end of the age, it says something very interesting. They will see. Their eyes will be opened. They will know what they did. Actually, this is Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10 where the prophet writes, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. They will know what they did. And it says that their response will be, they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. But see, you see again the heart of grace. Because it says in that same word of prophecy that he'll pour out on them the spirit of grace. See, the heart of the Lord is forgiveness. It's the same heart that God desires in us, knowing that if we do not forgive, then bitterness arises. It's like a root of bitterness. It's like Hebrews 12, 15. See to it, make sure of it, that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble because many are defiled by it. See, forgiveness. God wants you to have the freedom that comes from forgiveness. It's the nature and character of God revealed. Don't hold on to offense. Don't hold on to bitterness. You know what's interesting is that Oftentimes, they may not even realize how much hurt they caused. You know, you get cut off in traffic and then you fume while well, they're oblivious. And then you go home and take it out on everyone at home. No, he says, be free. Let go. Be free. It's very freeing. And one of the expressions I've come to love is this. Don't nail people to their offense. Don't nail people to their offense. You, you, you see, if you can't think of someone without also thinking of their offense, then you have nailed them to their offense. Be free. Be free. Now, the next words that Jesus spoke on the cross were these. You will be with me in paradise. We mentioned that Jesus was crucified between two others. Matthew tells us that they were criminals and hurling abuse at him. At the first, they were hurling abuse, it says. But then Luke tells us that one of them began to change. And in that change of heart, Jesus gave him eternal hope. This is Luke 23, verses 42 to 43, where this, this criminal, as he's changing his view of it, says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Uh, that, that's a wonderful, wonderful statement they made. Many people seem to be uh, hung up on the idea of heaven, not understanding what Jesus explained to his disciples. You see, because many people, they imagine heaven to be what they think earth should be, only better. What is heaven, they think? Well, in their minds, heaven is a place where there are beautiful golf courses. Or it's a place where there are perfect lakes for fishing. Or there are gourmet meals. So this is their idea of heaven. But notice, Jesus gave this word. He said, you will be with me. That's the glory of heaven. That's what makes heaven paradise. 
See, in John 14, we have those famous words, you believe in God, believe also in me. I go to prepare a place for you and I will come and receive you to myself that where I am, you may be. See, that's the whole glory of heaven to be with him. You see, now the next words of Jesus on the cross, again, they demonstrate the heart of God. They demonstrate relationship. Jesus made a point of caring for his mother. Notice in John 19, verse 26, when Jesus saw his mother and he saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's John. Woman, behold your son. Behold your mother. See, this is so beautiful. We are made for a relationship. God made us for relationship. And he's seen to it. It's just beautiful. I, I just love the heart revealed in that word. You know, when I, when I went to Oregon State, when I was a young man, I, I, I joined a fraternity because there was, you know, a longing to belong I wanted to be part of, you know, group and a sense of wanting to be in a family. But I'll tell you what, that desire to be long or to be included or to be part of something can get you into a lot of trouble. You see, that's why it's so important to recognize in Christ, we have a family. See, we're brothers, we're sisters, we have a father, there's a family. And in that family, there is something right that God builds in it. That's where he is the answer to the craving and the desire of the soul, even for relationship. Now notice when you go back to John 19 and the story of Jesus on the cross, would you notice to apply it this way, that by his love, he gives his death. Now look at this with me, because it's really a very important and deep insight. By his love, he gives his death. Now, at first, those words may seem uh, uh, hard to understand. What does that mean? Why would God want to give the death of Jesus? But the scripture tells us that the wages of sin is death. And so to give the death of Jesus is a glorious gift because now the payment has been made in full. See, John three sixteen. God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish. That's the heart of God. I don't want you to perish. So I give the answer. I want you to have eternal life. I give the answer by giving you the death of Christ. That's why, see, we have to recognize he, Jesus, was forsaken instead of us. This is what we see. This is the glorious gospel. He, Jesus, was forsaken instead of us. You know, the scripture tells us there was darkness. When Jesus was crucified, there was darkness from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, from 12 noon to 3 p.m. This was not a solar eclipse because the full moon of the Passover would have put the moon out of place for an eclipse. This, is, this was the hand of God moving in a picture, powerful demonstration. All of it is a picture of Christ taking our place and suffering instead of us because the darkness would have been the consequence that we would have suffered for our own sins. Darkness is a consequence of sin. See, notice Isaiah 59 verse 2. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you. See, he took that. He was forsaken instead of us. That's the picture. Um, Matthew 25, verse 30, Jesus was teaching. And he said, throw out that worthless slave into the outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's picturing their separation from God. It is darkness, outer darkness. After those words, Jesus called out the famous words we know from in another gospel. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. In Aramaic, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, that's, that's the point. He was forsaken 
instead of us. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now the Jewish leaders immediately would have recognized those words. They are directly quoted from Psalm 22, which everyone knew at the time was prophetic. It was a psalm which spoke of the Messiah. Written by David, foretells the way the Messiah would be killed. Psalm 22, notice verse 1 and verse 16. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is quoting it directly. A band of evil doers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Prophetic word. He was forsaken instead of us. See, by Christ being forsaken in our place, he makes a way so that we might be brought into a relationship, a living relationship with the Almighty God. That's why Matthew tells us and reveals that the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That is the veil which separated the most holy place and only the high priest could enter, and then once a year, and then only with blood. But the veil in the temple, you see, was torn. The way was made possible because that veil is a picture of the body of Christ now made a way for us to enter into the very presence of the living God. It makes all the difference in our lives. It's like Ephesians 2.13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far off have been brought near. And that by the blood of Christ. That's the glorious, that's the glorious result of what Jesus won for us on the cross. Imagine how lives would be changed if people only truly understood what it meant to live closer to God. We need to be closer. See, the way of the transgressor is hard. But the way of the Lord is life and peace. See, you live closer to God, he will give a foundation for which you can build your life. You will walk in better places. I'll tell you, it's a better life. He will help you. He will instruct you. He will establish you. You will walk in better places. I like Isaiah 30, verse 21. It kind of shows what it might look like walking in better places. He says, your ears will hear a word behind you. It's like the Holy Spirit. This is the way. Walk in it whenever you turn to the right or to the left. He will help you to walk in better places. This is what God won for you when Christ was on the cross. Next words. And we see this out of John 19 where he says, I thirst. You see his humanity in those words. But you see also in it a picture of what sin does to the soul. He died in our behalf. He died in our sin, the scripture tells us. And it shows, it shows the picture of what sin does to the soul. Thirst is a powerful thing. There's a longing, there's a thirsting. Deep, deep thirsting. It's a powerful drive and it's a picture of the empty soul that's longing and thirsting for something. The empty soul makes people driven by that. And they begin to search for something to satisfy, but they're searching in the wrong places. That's why Jesus gave this tremendous word in John chapter 7, verse 37. If anyone is thirsty, because that's the nature of the soul without God. That's the nature of the soul that's separated from God. I'm thirsty. He said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Now see, if you've ever been really, really, really thirsty, and then you drink like some cold water, it's like, ah, oh, that is so good. That is just so satisfying. When you're really thirsty. See, the soul is so empty and thirsty. He says... Let him come to me and let him drink because it goes, the water of life goes into the soul and it satisfies. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. The Holy Spirit will bring forth from you living water that will be a blessing to the people around you. 
Notice then next, we see the words of Jesus on the cross when he said this, to tell us die, it is finished. It's over. In other words, the debt of sin has been paid in full. See now, because of that, you can rejoice. There's reason to shout. There's reason to respond in loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength because of what he's done for you. Like that's a reason to shout right there. Some suggest, by the way, side note, one of the suggestions that I've heard is that after Christ died, he descended into hell where he suffered at the hands of Satan's demons for three days. I reject that idea completely. First of all, Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. I suggest if he said it's finished, it's finished. Secondly, I suggest also that Satan is not the captain of hell. That's the stuff of movies. Thirdly, Jesus also said in the final words that Jesus spoke on the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. That's his final words. Father, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Because of the death of Jesus on the cross, we can call him Father. That's why he died. That you can call him Father. Father, in heaven, we pray by calling you Father. What you have won for us, the relationship that you have bought for us is amazing. God, when we come to this day, when we recognize the words of Jesus on the cross, the suffering that he endured in our behalf, we recognize that this is not the end of the story. It's a very important day. It's very significant because this is the day that it was paid and paid in full that our sins were nailed to the cross when Jesus was nailed in our behalf. But it's not the end of the story because we know on the third day that he was raised from the dead. And so, Father, we come into your presence to recognize what you have done for us. And I just pray for everyone who is listening now, who is listening to this service, I pray that each person would make it personal to recognize that when Jesus was on the cross, suffering, he did that because of love for each person listening now. And I pray, God, that people would open their heart. If anyone thirsts, let them come to me and drink. If anyone is longing, if anyone is searching, the answer is in Jesus. He's the one that God sent us the answer. And I just pray, Father, for everyone listening now, they would open their heart. Church, if you're home, just continue praying. I just want to invite you today if you have been far from God, you know He died on the cross that you would be brought near. Don't be far. Don't wander. Draw near. He won the right for you, for sinners, to be brought near because He paid the price. Come near. Be near to Christ. Be near to God. He invites you. He is calling out to you. He is seeking after you. He's calling your name. He's knocking on the door of your heart. He's saying, open your heart. I'll dine with you. I'll relate in nearness. I'll have closeness. And it'll change your life. It will change your life. Lord, I pray for everyone listening that they would take hold of these words and that truly, they would be changed in the presence of the living God. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen and Amen.